year I've been working as a substitute teacher in the suburbs of Stockholm. Being a Swedish teacher for immigrants is the most fun I've had getting paid. We get to watch Igmar Berman movies, discuss our place in the universe, write letters to the Prime Minister, as long as it's Swedish. I get to travel the world on my metro card. Every day is very rewarding and non no day is the same. I also realized that Stockholm was a city a lot more segregated than I knew and it was filled with amazing people who didn't meet simply because they didn't know each other. So about four months ago, I appointed myself Minister of Dinners. So what I do, as a teacher, I go to the classroom and I ask the students, do you like food? Which most of them do. I ask them if they know any Swedes, which most of them don't. I then tell them that I have, have a bunch of Swedes who would like to have them over for dinner. It's free of charge, they can bring a friend, and it can happen any day they like. Logistically, or basically what I do is I go there, I hang out, talk, and invite. Logistically, uh, in the beginning I had Swedes saying that, yeah, I can have someone over on the 17th, uh, two months from now. <laughs> Whereas the student would say, oh, call me the same day and see if I'm free. As the date approaches, I match them up. So I call up the student, say, are you free for a dinner uh, at Kungsholmen on Tuesday? If they say yes, I send them a text with the address, the name, and the number of the person they're going to. The host gets a text with the name and the number of the guests, and also if they have any allergies or special food requirements. They meet, they dine. If they like, they take a picture. They have no obligation to see each other again. So statistically, Stockholm, or Sweden, is a multicultural country. One-fifth of the population is born abroad or born, where born by two parents who are born abroad. However, it leaves a lot to be decided when it comes to integration. The municipality where I've been work working mostly is the, s the municipality with the second highest immigrant population at nearly 40%. When I met one of my students at the subway and asked him, ah, oh, do you enjoy living there? His response was, nah, Nushboy, Afghanistan, same thing. <laughs> and Swedish for immigrants, though the language education has been free of charge for the past 50 years, but how, and more importantly, why, do you learn a language if you have no one to speak it with? So when I decided to have this learning year, or the year of teaching more specifically, I knew that something would come out of it. I just didn't know what it was. But the question, how had I gotten to know cultures and languages by hanging around natives? And how do we socialize in Sweden around the dinner table? This mixed with a hundred different ideas like network theories and the ongoing foodie craze was sort of taking shape into something. So the first time I asked the class if they wanted to have dinner with a Swede was last August. What did I do with that list? Nothing. I never called them. I was only at that school for a week. Uh, it felt weird. Things came up. It's also known as excuses. But something was cooking and my frustration over the fact that we weren't treating people like other human beings and there were so many problems that wouldn't have to be problems remained. So something was definitely cooking. Then one gray day in February, on a break at school, I went to a computer. I copy pasted the state sign and printed out some forms. So I went to the class, I handed these forms out, I collected them, took a photo, put on Instagram and Facebook, and I asked my friends, I have a bunch of students who would like to have dinner at your place. Are you up for it? So I got 63 likes. 13 people said, yeah, I'm up for it. When I then 
ask these people to, okay, give me a concrete date that would be good for you, the response rate fell to a five. About a month later, I was interviewed by the main morning show on Swedish radio, um, and as the week when I was going to broadcast it came closer, I was preparing. I stopped drinking coffee and I did yoga in the morning. I was prepared for the storm of this. Everyone wanted to be invi or invite people for dinner. Uh, but that, that day came, and what happened after being broadcast across the nation? Four people emailed me, say they wanted to have someone over for dinner. Three journalists called me and said, yeah, I would like to talk to you and possibly tag along to a dinner. Um, and in all fairness, it might have been too early in the morning, and people didn't really catch the name. And at the time, I didn't have a website either. I was just working or sort of using Facebook as the platform. But it was still something that I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Was it the fear that the language skills, that it would be uncomfortable to have someone who didn't really speak Swedish sitting at your dinner table? But only the higher level students fill out the form correctly. Rather, I came to terms with that people weren't necessarily hostile towards the idea. Their hearts were good, but they were lazy, insecure, and under the impression that they didn't have time to cook an extra meal for someone. They were clearly modern human beings. So in the sort of mist of medium despair, Okay, something blew up. Okay, I don't know what it was. Possibly a, pr uh, a mixture of local print, Facebook, and national TV. But all of a sudden, I had an avalanche of hundreds of people wanting to invite for dinners. So this imi these invitations were rolling in through Facebook, through the homepage, and through email into a complete administrative chaos I had no idea how to handle. But on the other hand, these were good problems to have, not a lack of people. So what I'm saying is that you need to have patience, and you definitely need the early adopters. You can't do this on your own, and you need to make sure that people who are in their comfort zone get out there. Kay? And with social media, you can show the early adopters to the world, see that it's no big deal, you're definitely not doing anyone a favor, but you're getting an experience. That said, and all these smiles you see on the slides, I can leave no guarantee that you will have a good time. <laughs> Throughout or along the way, we had people are very shy who don't ask questions. People are arriving very late, not finding the directions, not knowing how that street numbers go up and down. There had been two no-shows, short notice cancellations. One man arriving thinking that he's going to go to a restaurant with the whole SFI class. Now he finds himself at a private person's house with his wife, empty-handed and completely confused. Or as this gentleman here, Solomon, having arrived two hours late but compensating his fluid approach to time with different dairy products, cookies and fruit juice. So I cannot emphasize enough to myself or to you the importance of communication. Where different cultures meet, you get friction, and that's also where you get misunderstanding. But it's in within that space of misunderstanding you can find understanding as long as you're willing to look for it. So what is the result? Do these people become friends? Do they meet again? I don't know, and maybe it's too early to tell. It's not really the point either of these, this randomized matchmaking. The result itself is the dinner, to eat, meet, and speak. Yesterday was dinner 42, or person 173 inviting someone to their home or arriving somewhere and feeling welcome. My ambition is to have 10,000 dinners before election day three months from now. Not because I think it will have an effect on the outcome, but because I need a challenge and a clear deadline, and because we all need a reminder that there's so many more things we can do than vote, 
to actually create a society that we want to live in. This can't be done by one person, but rather a network of many. And I'm also aware that technical solutions in your smartphone would be enabled to scale this up to a much greater extent. But before I end, I would like to point out the strangeness of it all. Two people are to meet and have dinner. Do we really need someone to administer this? As one internet user pointed out, that this is the most bizarre, objectifying and emph emphasizing of otherization that he has ever seen, and this could only happen in Sweden. <laughs> and yes, in all fairness, the same way as the problem is Swedish, that we don't talk to each other, the solution where you prefer and find it attractive to give your address and door code to a stranger and someone else would tell you, oh, you should go to this address, and you, fully trusting the good intentions of it all, could only work in this country. So it's a love-hate relationship. We have been eating together for thousands of years. Somewhere along the line, we start to make things complicated. I don't know when, but I know that we can change that. It could be dinner with a neighbor, a political opponent, maybe even a new colleague, because you want to do this outside of your comfort zone, remembering that it's a lot easier to include than try hard to be included. Sharing a meal is, or sharing a meal is food culture at its finest, and building trust is what we need in society and having fun is never a bad idea. <laughs> yeah.